is the sample preparation laboratory for radiocarbon dating and today we're going to show you a little bit about how radiocarbon dating is done. So how does radiocarbon dating work? It's actually pretty simple. All living things contain carbon and there are three naturally occurring isotopes of carbon. Carbon 12, 13, and 14. Carbon 14 is naturally radioactive. It's formed in the upper atmosphere through the interaction of cosmic rays with nitrogen, nitrogen atoms and that carbon-14 that's been formed is rapidly oxidized as carbon dioxide and gets incorporated into the atmosphere. Plants take it up from the atmosphere as CO2. So the C14 is rapidly mixed throughout the environment. Actually, there's a lot more carbon-12 and carbon-13 in living organisms than carbon-14, but all living things are naturally radioactive because they contain carbon-14. As long as an organism is living and breathing and taking in food, then it's in equilibrium with its environment and it has a constant ratio of 12 to 13 to 14. When an organism dies, it's no longer taking in any new carbon, so at that point the carbon-14 in the organism begins to decay away. That's kind of like the start of the stopwatch for radiocarbon dating. If we can accurately and precisely measure how much C14 is in our sample now, we know how much should have been in the sample when it was alive, we can then use an equation to calculate how much time has passed since that organism was alive, and that's radiocarbon dating. Of course, the tricky part is being able to accurately and precisely measure how much C14 is left, and that's where all the effort in the laboratory comes in. So the types of materials that we normally radiocarbon date include things like wood, plant remains, uh, charcoal from charred wood, animal products like bone or leather or sinew or horn or antler or um, skin, you know, parchment. Also, art archaeological artifacts that are made from plants and animals. The types of things we can't radiocarbon date are geological materials, so we can't date stone or glass, and we also can't date some things that are beyond the dating range of radiocarbon. We can only radiocarbon date back to about 50,000 years ago because of the half-life of radiocarbon, which is 5,730 years. Date some things that are beyond the dating range of radiocarbon. We can only radiocarbon date back to about 50,000 years ago because of the half-life of radiocarbon, which is 5,730 years. You see here the games they play, especially with the younger people when they're teaching them this kind of science. What she should have said was, anything that was once living will only be able to be dated back to an age of about 57,000 years. After that, there will not be enough carbon, 14, to give us a date. It's still datable, or testable. Anything older than 57,000 years will not give us an age. It would simply be a dry test. Yet, to date, there has not been one single dry test. After about 10 half-lives, which would be 57,000 years, the amount of C14 that was originally in that organism is so tiny that we can't really accurately and precisely measure it with most of the radiocarbon dating equipment in laboratories around the world. Now, does this mean <clears throat> you cannot date something that you suspect is older than 57,000 years using the carbon-14 dating method? As many atheists will tell you, you can't date that. It's too old. We know it's too old, so we know you can't date it using carbon-14 we must use another method. But what would actually happen if you used carbon-14 dating on something that was actually 200,000 years old or older? Well, I'd like to point out the dipstick. Okay, because carbon-14 is really just a dipstick test. You're measuring how much 
something is left in the object. That's what a dipstick does. Okay, <clears throat> something freshly dyed would read full because it would be in an uh, equilibrium with the atmosphere. Okay, so that you know is full. You don't know what the atmosphere's equilibrium point was a million years ago, five million years ago, whatever. Okay, but we do know what it is today. So if something just died, we can accurately say it just died using carbon-14. Now, you're not going to get an overfall using carbon-14 like you would on a dipstick in an engine that had too much oil. Because... A living object that died cannot exceed the equilibrium of the atmosphere. So that part of the test is out. But you then have the other methods or the other results of the dipstick at lower and lower and lower uh, levels. And the lower the level of oil on a dipstick probably would equate to the amount of miles you've put on it since the last oil change. Very similar to carbon-14. The lower the level of carbon-14, the longer the item has been dead, and the more carbon-14 has left. Okay, when people tell you they can't test something that they know is 65 million years old, they're telling you several lies. One is, they don't know it's 65 million years old. Number two, they can test anything of any age, and it's not going to harm any of the test equipment, and it's not going to cause someone to go to jail for breaking laws. It is simply what would be expected to be a dry test. When something is that old, it should be completely out of carbon-14. As you saw previously, at 57,000 years, it gets too small to distinguish. Well, at 65 million years, it's going to be zero. Okay, it's going to be the dry dipstick, as you see on the left. Okay, so, not only are they lying about the age, saying we know it's too old to test, but they're also lying, saying they can't make the test. They can make the test, and should make the test, as that's real science. There is nothing wrong with taking a, a test and getting a dry result. What's wrong is not taking the test and telling people how old it is. That's wrong. Now, I understand that mineralized fossils can't be tested, but there are thousands, if not millions, of dinosaur parts and whatnot that are not mineralized, pointing to the possibility that they're really not that old. So that would require more scientific investigation and a carbon-14 test. Um, because... Carbon-14 doesn't work on something like this. Right. Your results that you get can be all over the place. Well, they should be infinity. It should be not datable. In other words, it shouldn't come back saying it's 25,000 years old. Right. It should be infinity. Right. Obviously, your group is a group of creationists. Yes. And... And um, and the spin they can get off of it, right? Doing it is well, not going to help. Not going to help us. Yeah. So even though it's just a scientific test, carbon-14 dating something with soft tissue in it. <laughs> Jack, if I could raise $20,000, would it be worth? Uh, 
I will talk to Mary Schweitzer about it. Okay. okay. I appreciate that. And uh, I asked Dr. Mary Schweitzer if she gets carbon from the dinosaur bones, and she said that she gets a lot of carbon. Um, because carbon-14 doesn't work on something like this, right? your results that you get could be all over the place. And uh, I asked... Dr. Mary Schweitzer, if she gets carbon from the dinosaur bones, and she said that she gets a lot of carbon. Obviously, Jack Horner and Mary Schweitzer are running carbon-14 tests on the T-Rex that they found the soft tissue in, yet the results are kept secret. I wonder why that is. <laughs> 